Detailing Magazine. And today's webinar is getting ready for the summer selling season. And we're going to be talking about, um, well, this is, this is actually our first installment in a series of webinars throughout the year. It corresponds to the cover story in this month's issue of Hardware Retailing. We're going to be focusing on summer, and throughout the rest of the year, we're going to focus, well, next one will be on, on fall, then winter, and then spring, finally in December. But for summer, we want to focus on how you as a home improvement retailers can prepare your store as well as plan your sales strategy for the year. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that there's a lot of categories in the summer, uh, like lawn and garden and outdoor power equipment, which, is, which tend to be carryovers from the spring tend to be carryovers from the spring. And so there may not be a lot of differences in the product mixes, but you're going to see some, some differences. Uh, for instance, you know, people are going to want to start thinking about staying cool during the summer, so you might sell a lot of fans and air conditioners. Uh, people might be going on vacation, so you might look for a few, um, maybe, maybe they want to do something to the car, a few car care supplies, or going on a camping trip. They might be looking for some sporting goods. And also realize that another thing about the summer is a lot of retailers have told me it just gets hot and people don't want to do anything outside. And so they may be a little sluggish about starting that DIY project. So take that into consideration as you're planning maybe some outdoor events or some promotions for the summer. What can you do to get people motivated to um, tackle another project or just to come in the store and, and buy something? Um, the other thing is that with all the busyness of the spring season, it may be a challenge to keep the store clean and to to, to think about the summer. During the winter, it's, you're thinking about, you know, it's a little slower and it may be easy to plan out some of those displays. But when the summer hits, you've just come off of a busy season and it, it may be easy to just kind of let slumber, summer slide by. So as we look at the summer season and as we think about preparing for summer, we're going to talk about um, five areas of the store here. One is we're going to look at some of the key departments of the stores. We're going to look at a few store operations like inventory and merchandising. We want to talk about employee training. Then we want to look at summer promotions. What are some of the special events that retailers have been doing? And maybe you can get some ideas from those. We're going to wrap up with a few trends. Uh, a, few, uh, a few a few items that may be selling well in your area, and we want to hear from our panelists about what is maybe selling well in their area. And that is um, part of the, part of today. We have some panelists this, with us today. We have Tom Toth from Prescott True Value in Prescott, Arizona, and then we have Angie Nelson with from Balsam Lake. Hardware Hank in Balsam Lake, Wisconsin. She buys from United Hardware. And we also have Richard Hassett, who is at the Ocean Shore Hardware in Half Moon Bay, California. So quite a range of, of uh, retailers here from across the country. And we want to, be, want to hear from them later on as well once we get started. But welcome to each one of you, and thank you for joining us this morning, this afternoon, whatever it might be in your time zone. First, I'd like to look at a few of the key departments and want to round down a few of these and have our panelists chime in um, about how some of these departments work for them. You know, most people have likely finished a major planning in the spring. So when it comes to lawn and garden, you think of spring and summer as lawn and garden. Summer is still going to be strong. It, it, some of the categories may not be as strong in the summer as in the spring. People may have switched from planting to maintaining. So they've planted the flower bed and they've got the lawn started off right. Now it's time to water it, get the sprinkler system going. It's time to um, to sell some hoses and some nozzle ends. So there's a maintenance um, mode here. But also remember in this category, and the, and the same goes to in the spring, this is a very competitive category and you all should know this. You're not the only one that sells this. In fact, you're competing against everyone, not, and then not just Home Depot and Lowe's, but you're competing against the grocery store down the street, the dollar store, even the gas station that sometimes sells a few plants. So 
So if you're going to stand out in this category, it really calls for you to be unique in some way. And you can get the unique products in there, you can get the higher quality items, but what really makes a difference is having that product knowledge, having your employees know their stuff when it comes to plants, what's the right chemical to put on those plants, you know, a customer comes in, what flower can I grow in the shady spot in my lawn? Well, it could be your store that knows the answer to that and keep them from going down to the gas station or the grocery store to buy their fertilizer. Um, Richard, I'd like to ask you, I know your store has, they're in Ocean Shore, they, you have a greenhouse and a pretty nice selection of lawn chemicals. Can you talk just a little bit about your lawn and garden department and um, some of the strong sellers and, and um, what you do in your department to drive traffic during the summer? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I'm uh, Richard Hassan from Half Moon Bay, California. So we're right next to the ocean. I can hit my three iron over there. So uh, uh, we've got a pretty nice growing season all year, summer and spring and summer especially. Um, we've got soils is one of our best categories. We just sell that all year long. Um, we use some rolling racks on the uh, right by the front doors with a lot of color um, this in spring. Um, I've got two full-time employees that are maintaining the plants. There are two master gardeners in the back maintaining the plants all, all year, making sure that they're just fully stocked and as many plants as you can get hanging all over the place. And we use the, the rack that you can see on that on that um, picture here is uh, we've got a, a, about three, I would say, 20-foot runs out in our parking lot full. So really getting as much product out in front of the store out uh, when they're coming in and out that really really drives sales on those colors um, and then we've just got a bunch of pallets uh, racking for the soils and back um, and we just we take advantage of I'm, I'm not sure how many ace hardware dealers are here but they we take advantage of the ace restock program where they offer uh, you can make a discovery purchase for however many much product you'd like and you don't pay for it till June so we really pack okay. it in um, and we just did that uh, uh, last week, so we've got we placed an order for about 20% of, of the full uh, last year's sales um, in pretty much every every item in the department. Okay, and you said you got that order in last week, so you're getting started pretty early. And which is another point we'll bring up later is that it's um, getting started early is kind of the key for summer and spring. All right, we have four stores, and I brought it all in. Um, early because we've got this cold front right now is probably the last big storm that we're predicting for our growing season. So we're, um, we're gearing up right now. Good. Angie, would do you have anything to add? I know you, we have a picture later on of your garden market. We, we saw it just a minute ago. Do you have anything to add in terms of what sells well or how you get that season or that, that department geared up? Um, well, I'm on the other end of the country, and I just um, got through 12 inches of snow that were dumped on us yesterday. So um, I don't have plants that I'm ready to put out and about, and I have to be a whole lot more conscious of what my weather's doing and what's going to be involved there because um, I have to keep my plants from freezing. Um, even into the second and third week of May, we have frost problems. So um, I have to not... I utilize my parking lot as most I can, but I can't overstock because i got to be able to bring everything inside or somewhere so it can stay warm. Um, during my hot selling season, which would be May and June and into the first week of July, um, I also have a master gardener on staff, um, and I have a lot of customers that utilize that base. My customer base in the summer and the spring is focused on lake homes and people that travel an hour to two hours to me to their lake home, and then I'm not hauling that product, but then coming to us to find what they want to fill that need at their lake home. Okay. So as you mentioned, you have to be a lot more conscientious about or just careful about the weather because if you leave it out one night, it's going to freeze and your whole inventory is lost. That is correct. Well, Tom, Toth, in um, kind of in the middle there in Arizona, talk about your lawn and garden department and how anything unique about it. 
Well, we're, our, uh, yeah, we're a little unique in Arizona, but we're still a mile high, so we get uh, snow. I just had six inches of snow yesterday, so we also have to be a little bit uh, attentive to the weather and, and the conditions that are going on. But um, primarily we geared up uh, for our summer selling season back in uh, December, early January. Uh, most of our inventory is already arriving um, in terms of the hard goods. We won't get into our flowers and our green goods until uh, usually late March for us, early April. And, you know, we will set up the, the store and be ready to roll for spring and early summer season. Our summer lasts, uh, you know, in Arizona typically until late uh, September, early October. Okay. Well, very good. Another department that we're finding is strong is, of course, the grills and outdoor living as well. And, you know, customers might make a grill purchase in the spring, but they might make one in the summer too. You know, there's a long season. Maybe they built a deck in the spring and now they want to use it. So grills can always, always sell well, but nothing sells a grill better than seeing it in, act, in action. So on a weekend, a, a, one good way to promote your grill department is to haul it out front and, and fire it up and throw in a bunch of hot dogs or something. Get it cooking and, get, and give away some, something for the customers. That way they see it, they can, they can smell it, and all those senses together um, should help sell but also when it comes to grills we've noted we know we know some retailers that use uh, that have grill tune-ups if the customers already bought a really nice Weber grill or another grill last year they may not buy another one this year but they may bring it up to, in to get a tune-up you can also sell propane um, have, a, have a refilling ses- section and don't forget about sauces and rubs and all the different accessories that you can still sell that customer any of our panelists do well with grills and have any advice to offer other retailers who are looking for a way to make that department sparkle this summer? Uh, Richard Hassett, yeah. I've um, I've heard from a n- number of other ACE dealers that do the same thing I do. I've got a mobile gentleman that uh, offers to do barbecue cleaning, so if it's the beginning of the season, they'll go out, uh, you know, 60 bucks. They'll take, they'll clean the whole barbecue, fire it up, make sure everything's working right. And there's also a product out there called Scratch Be Gone, which works amazing on the stainless steel. So during their cleaning process, there you can purchase a kit. Uh, it's a kind of a sandpaper with a with a honing oil solution that basically uh, works really, really well for those side tables and the Weber's. So that can be an add-on, you know, 15 bucks. I can get this whole stainless steel barbecue, you know, basically scratch-free. Uh, the major gouges can't come out, but the minor scratches that every barbecue has, um, it's a, a cool little service to offer if you uh, have somebody that you're willing to send out mobily to clean. Is that someone who's a employee of your store, or do you hire them on just for the season? That's an employee of our store. We're lucky, actually. We've got the contract with Weber to do the regional um, service calls. One of my employees got set up with them, so they actually service the you know, do all the repair work as well. So when he's on call, uh, you know, on a Weber call because they have a, a warranty issue or something, he actually is out there anyway. Then he offers the other services, and so we're pretty lucky in that respect. Okay, very good. Angie or, or Tom, do you have anything to add about grills? This is Angie, and um, one um, asset that we have um, because of our location and is the delivery mechanism. A lot of people don't have trucks or don't have, and most all the grills, even though it's a time-consuming process to put them together, um, our customers really appreciate um, the delivery factor and that they're assembled, and they can look at it right on um, and compare them all, and it's also something I stress to my employees in learning all the different things um, about each grill that's different so they can answer customers' questions very easily and help them make a good decision. Okay. Delivery is certainly an important part because some customers may get dissuaded from buying a grill because they don't know how to get it to their house. So, Tom, do you have anything to add? You know, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there when you said having the products out there to be demonstrated. Uh, we do a lot of that um, from March and through August. We'll have weekly demonstrations on our grills, whether it be the Big Green Egg or a Tech or Weber or uh, as simple as a, a Charbroil. But uh, we 
definitely think that's important. Not only does it help uh, sell the grills, but as you said before, it also helps sell the seasonings and the rubs and the sauces and uh, a variety of other things that you can add on quickly to the sale. And if a customer already has a grill, they're great little essentials that they can just, uh, you know, taste and, and see and, and, you know, reflect and get them in that uh, way. Also, you know, the basting brushes and the, the tools and things like that. So I, I think it's very important to make sure that you do some sort of demonstrations or uh, if nothing else, have a sampling out there of the products. Right, and everybody likes free food, so that's always a sure win. No doubt. Jesse, also, uh, one thing that we found to be extremely popular with our customers is we'll take their old grill um, because it doesn't, you know, it's not a big issue for us and we leave it by our dumpster and the guys that do the metal recycling come by they love picking it up because that's that's some good money for them so we never have a problem getting rid of our grills and it's a good service to offer you can charge you know maybe 10 bucks or something if you wanted to make a little extra money but right that's another yeah what do we do with the old drill well we'll take it it's another service you're right another category which a lot of retailers um, do well in our pool chemicals you know we, the chlorine People keep coming back for that. They need that throughout the season, and of course, they need that in the winter too if they have a they have a hot tub or something. But you can add to the chlorine by adding accessories and toys. These are high um, like toys and say skimmers or other things that you might need for the pool, and those tend to be the higher margin items, which can fill out the category. So I know retailers have had success with that, and kind of related to that would be sporting goods. And again, this is a niche area that you know that a few do have success with. If you just have a few spare inches, this this retailer had some room on the ceiling, so he hung a canoe there. If you have a, um, some space for a for a niche, this can be a, a nice way to um, to attract some other customers. We've seen several studies that show in the past few years that hunting, fishing, and camping are all up. Uh, Places that um, the states have reported hunting licenses and fishing licenses, they're issuing more of them. Uh, the National Association of State Park Directors say people are staying longer in, in campgrounds. So it seems to be a trend that people are having more interest in outdoor activities. So this is another another kind of a niche category that you might find. So I wanted to see if our panelists has, has anyone of, has any of the three of you had success with sporting goods or pool chemicals. This is Angie, and um, with my lake and a lot of lakes right close to me, um, I have relative success with um, lake toys, um, inflatables you pull behind a boat, um, fishing poles. I have a lot of grandmas and grandpas that will come in and need four fishing poles for their kids because their kids are up for the weekend and um, fishing off the dock and those types of things. Um, I don't have the expertise on board to have an extensive sporting goods department because I believe you need a lot of expertise to be real and exclusive in sporting goods. But those grandma and grandpas and um, toys and playthings, um, impulse items, um, I've done very well with. Okay, and that's a good point. Even if you even if you can't go deep in it, there's always room for just a few things on the shelf that, uh, like I said, for the vacationers, for the grandpa and grandmas. Uh, this is Richard. Um, I haven't had much success with hunting or fishing because California doesn't allow you to do that anymore. So uh, <laughs> um, the one area I do have success in um, is knives, just having a, a simple knife display kit. Um, that, that sells really well at all four of my stores. And then the other one is uh, RV supply. A lot of guys, a lot of people during the summer doing uh, the RV camping trips. That's becoming really much more popular, in my opinion. Um, I've just seen those sales uh, consistently climb over the last three or four years because people are doing those cheaper uh, vacations. So that's a good category to research. And Ace, uh, if anyone's an Ace out there, they just re did their set. Uh, so take a look at it. Okay, very good. Tom, what about Arizona? Um, you know, we do fairly well in you know, the pool supplies and chemicals like that. Uh, we don't get heavy into sporting goods at all, but we do do the water toys and the um, – um, pool toys and things like that, and we've seen that actually increase quite a bit in the past uh, couple of years, as well as, uh, as he was saying, the RV supply has definitely uh, seen an increase, especially in our area here where people are getting more of the RV stuff from us that they can't find in other areas and uh, more of a convenience good for them. And along with that, again, is, is propane. Uh, we do propane filling, and we get a 
a ton of RVs that come in over the weekends or the week to get their RV ready to go. So I think propane is a big aspect in that too. Okay, and what I've heard, propane is a pretty high margin yes. as well. That's That rings true with what you've experienced. It can be very profitable, yes. Another category in, is the outdoor power equipment, and this ties in a lot with with service and repair and as well as rental. And, you know, I've heard retailers say that if, or one retailer told me that it, he uses the his service and repairman, the, the guy in the back who fixes everything, actually as his salesman for the rental and power, outdoor power equipment. Because he's the guy who knows the most about how it operates. And those are the kinds of questions that, that the customer is going to have. And so that's the, his most knowledgeable employee. And, all, and also, when it comes to outdoor power equipment, you know, the summers is when they're going to start getting their heaviest use. So think, think now about how you're going to run your service department. And even if you don't have a service department, if you're, if you're a retailer and you just don't have the space or the expertise, it helps if, you have, if, if your employees know a little bit about what it takes to repair. Even just the, simple, the, the basics, how to change a blade, how to change a spark plug, how to drain the oil. Then if they just know those basics, customers are going to come in and say, you know, how can I fix my mower myself or how can I do a tune-up? Even if your employees just know those basics, I think that's going to go a long way towards helping in that category, even, and even if you don't sell a lot of major power equipment. Tom, I know that you have a program. You, you kind of use the slower winter months to encourage your customers to get that service work done early so you're not just inundated in the spring and the summer. Can you talk a little bit about what you do um, in, your, in your outdoor power equipment service department? Yeah, we offer it on both ends of the season. We offer a pre-season tuna special starting in February. Um, March we'll run that, and that will give them the opportunity to get their lawnmower in and get it geared up for the spring or the summer season so that, again, we're not uh, uh, overwhelmed and not able to perform up to our standards in the, in the summertime when everybody last minute uh, tries to get their stuff in. Um, so it's as simple as just you know doing a spark plug replacement and cleaning the air filter, giving it a quick tune-up, changing the oil, things like that. That uh, has been pretty successful for us, and we'll, it'll help us offset our January, February, March months when we're typically a little bit slow in our service department. And then we also offer it at the end of the season when they're ready to put it back in their garage and store it. So we'll have a a winterization uh, type special that goes on with it. And you know both of those are pretty pretty inexpensive. It doesn't take a guys very long. Um, you know, it's about a forty-five, fifty-dollar uh, value that we we attach to it, and it just gets them into the store and out of the store when they need to be, and um, it's been pretty good for us. Okay. Um, Richard, have you or Angie? Do you have any? Um, do you sell outdoor power equipment? This is Angie, and um, I sell very minimal at this point in time. Um, I have uh, just hired um, somebody with some repair experience and some product knowledge and um, hope to develop that category more. But I guess I agree with you, Jesse, in the basic knowledge that you can help your customers. Um, up here in Wisconsin, the last year and a half, we've had real issues with gas and the change in formulations of gas situations and the um, effects on small engines and even that knowledge so the customer is frustrated and comes in because they can't keep their small engine running, um, the knowledge of the gas getting old fast and how to stabilize that gas has really become important in giving us some confidence that we know what we're talking about to the customer. Okay, and that's it. Yes, thanks. That's a good point. Uh, just to follow up what Angie's saying, the um We've got the t uh, the new product that's a 30 to 1 and a 50 to 1 in a can. It's a little, uh, well, I guess it's a quart cylinder. Yep. Um, those are those are becoming really popular because they're pre-mixed, they're stabilized, so they can last in the can or in the machine for two years, I think is what the mechanics are saying. So if you don't have that product, I definitely recommend that. We give one of those cans to each customer we sell free because – gets it in their mind, hey, I can, you know, I don't need to mess with the, the two-to-one oil. I don't need to go to the gas station with it. You know, I can just come back, grab it, another cylinder, another uh, another one of these, and just put it right in my engine and go. So uh, definitely, if you don't have that product, look into, get, you know, look into bringing that in. Um, we, uh, we have about 40-something feet of Husky we brought in last year. We just did another $10,000 restocking order. Um, 
two months ago, and then we did a demo day where we brought a big old redwood log and demoed the chainsaws, and we had great success. We offered a 10% discount on any um, power equipment that day, or that weekend, I'm sorry, and the free gas, and um, that seems to turn out pretty good for us. Okay, well, thanks. That's a good promotion. We had another question. Um, uh, one of our listeners here had a quick question on the propane filling What's your recommendation, uh, I think Tom and anyone else who may have a propane tank filling, versus um, filling the tanks versus a tank exchange? What do you think is more profitable? What are some of the pros and cons of, of either one of those? Um, you know, I'll, for us, we do both. We do the propane exchange as well as the propane refilling. Um, from a profit standpoint, the refilling has been much more profitable for us. The exchange is handy because uh, if you have a customer that comes in with a tank that isn't up to the, the requirements or the standards, then you can offer them an exchange tank that they can take with them, and then, of course, we can refill it later for them. Um, so that's been big for us. But I, I think overall, um, if you're going to get into the propane business, uh, refill is the way to go. Okay. Very good. I would Any say other comments on that? I would say that's true um, if you have the space. I just simply don't have the space. Um, California doesn't like blowing stuff up, so I, got, I only ha I can only do the refills. So uh, yeah. it seems to work out. And I, I also don't want to put myself in the position where I'm sure everyone's been to the U-Haul where you can't find anyone to fill it and you get disgusted and you take off because – so you lose the customer because, you know, there's not somebody on, on hand to fill it at 730 at night one night, you know. That's, yeah, a good point. And I, I only do the exchange for a lot of the same reasons of space and room and liabilities and all those types of things. So I do the exchange, and um, I'm in agreement with you, Richard, that if you provide a service at 8 o'clock in the morning or at 2 o'clock in the afternoon at 8.30 at night, you should have somebody on staff that can provide the same service or customers will get frustrated. Okay. And one quick – oh, go ahead. Uh, so we've had success with that, you know, the fact that what we do is put a call button out there at the station. Um, our mechanics that are back in the service center that do our power equipment repairs are on hand to do all the propane. And we have uh, about uh, 25 people that are certified in doing it. So for us, uh, the hours operation and the performance has been has been successful. The tank's right there by the gate, and it's easy to get to and control. And um, so from that standpoint, I guess uh, I would say, yeah, you have to have enough staff, but you can you can manage it pretty reasonably. Okay. And we just had another question on the uh, brand name of that 30 to 1, 50 to 1 cylinders for long, longer lasting um, power that you were just talking about. I think it was Richard. What's the, what's the brand name on that stabilizer? You know, I just sent one of my employees down to grab one of the cans, so I can't remember off the top of my head. I'll get back to you on that. Okay, sure. Well, we got some time here. Well, the next thing we want to talk about inventory. And as we mentioned earlier, this is a, a, uh, pretty important part of making sure that you have enough stock. You know, the last thing you want to do is, is to uh, not have the stuff there, the, the, the product there when the spring or summer hits, and you want to be able to keep it through. And Richard, I know you have a, a fairly scientific way of, of making your ordering, and, and maybe you can kind of explain how you, you have the inventory when the, the season hits. Sure, sure. Um, like I said before, I, I do utilize the ACES um, uh, preseason purchase every year. So each one of my stores does purchase quite a bit just to get my shelves full. Uh, it spills over into the aisles. It spills over into the end caps. So I'm, I'm packed to the gills when it comes to having product, and I don't have to pay for it till June. So um, I just kind of use 20% as my uh, benchmark, and it seems to work out pretty well. My employees get a little frustrated because it seems like they're drowning in it, but it sells and we, we get pretty thin toward the end of the season anyway, so I, I think it's a, a good opportunity for those of you who can do that. Um, I also have um, a, a program called Inventory Master that basically calculates my order points for every single item every single night. Um, it's a program that another ACE owner developed, um, so if you have the capability for an ACE or a true value, you might want to take a look at it, but um, it's sort of a it's a lot of front work. You got to set up a whole bunch of rules to tell it what it is. But I can, you know, tell my uh, my my order point calculation to uh, bump up in in March and drop down in January. And uh, you can write essentially any rule that you can think of in terms of how you want your computer to order for you. So 
um, if you have any questions about that, I guess I can give you my email or something um, where you can check out the, their website. But that's how I do order points for essentially all all ACE items in my uh, in my store. Angie or Tom, do you have a um, any strategies you want to share with us? You know, I, I do the same thing, similar to what uh, Richard does. We obviously take advantage of what True Value offers in terms of their uh, preseason buys. Uh, we'll buy our inventory uh, probably a little heavier than 20%. We're, we're normally going into it around 30 35% of our inventory uh, early. Uh, what we found is that, obviously, if you have it on the floor and you have a lot of it, it definitely moves out and people get the impression that you're in stock. Uh, we also use our vendors on a direct uh, basis uh, with a preseason order that we can get it floored in the store and then have, you know, 180 days or 120 days to pay for it. I uh, definitely think that's a huge uh, advantage for us uh, in terms of what our customers perceive our inventory levels are. And getting it in early just offers the opportunity to, to show that you're in the business and you're geared up for it. All right. And this is Angie, and I likewise um, use United's uh, programs to buy ahead and uh, get good dating. Um, I believe that showing impact and in inventory um, does give the customers the feeling that, oh, I can go there, they have it, I don't have to worry. Um, I'm not going to take one or two bags. If I need 15 or 20 bags of fertilizer, um, I know they're going to be stocked and ready, ready to go. Um, my computer system at United also has order points and calculations to help uh, me make good decisions in purchasing and being ready to go when spring hits. Right, and that's you know kind of the key point for for everyone here, regardless of the system that you use. It's being ready early, and I know some people will even order as early as the fall for the spring, and then probably a lot. Of, like I said, a lot of those products are come for the summer. So, Richard, you just sent us, sent us a little note here. Everybody saw that. 50 Fuel, a, a True South product? Yeah, that's what it is. Yep. Okay. I'm looking for the, the um, website for it right now. Okay. Well, the next, we want to move on here and talk about merchandising. Um, this is a pretty critical part during any time of the year. But when it comes to the, the summer, it's important not to slack off on merchandising and to make sure you always have those uh those shelves full, as well as have nice, clean displays. So I'm going to talk just about six different merchandising areas of the stores, run through them real quickly, and then we'll, we'll go back to our panelists and ask them a, a few things. But the power aisle, that's always a spot that, that needs to be full. And, you know, the power aisle is not just about bagged goods on pallets. Those are important because you want to show people that you have all the inventory and that you have what they need, like we were saying earlier. But you can also use it to, to set the tone for the store because that, that's the, if that's the first thing people see, that kind of sets the tone. So if you don't have um, pallets in there, maybe you want to put a nice spread of grills or some patio furniture. You can even use that area for impulse items or dump bins. Maybe put some pet toys down down the middle there, or or put some other sorts of toys, people toys, so to speak. And that can be a, a place for impulse items and really setting the tone for the store. And if we're speaking of impulse items, uh, consumables are another are another thing to put in there. You can see here that we have a few rocking chairs, but we also have a, a big bucket of Gatorade. And we have some bottles of water. So those sports drinks and those th that water is going to be key for the summer. You're going to have a lot of guys out there sweating all day, and they're going to they they may want to come in in early in the morning and pick up a case of water or a case of sports of a sports drink. And th another thing you might consider is is uh, keep a cooler behind the counter, fill it with water or fill it with Gatorade or something. And if you got a guy coming in and he's looking hot and sweaty, he's grimy, he looks tired, just toss him a free bottle of water. Say that this one's on the house. It kind of as a goodwill gesture and make that part of your marketing budget. You know, it's not something you have to make a big um, big deal about, but just have that as kind of a added bonus for some of your of your better customers. And it's a great way to just to build some goodwill among amongst especially those contractors who are going to be out in the heat all day. Another thing are the end caps. You want to always rotate the end caps and think about some of those seasonal project favorites like uh, pool chemical sprinklers, um, car care products, picnic supplies, and end caps are a good place for unique items as well. 
it's a good place to stock those things that you buy at the market. Some of those new products that you found, you can you can put a sign on there that says, "I found this at my the market I went to last month," and that kind of lets people know that you're keeping up with what's new, and this is something that that they may not find somewhere else. Uh, temporary displays. These are, this is a an, another great way to sell sell a product. It may be as simple as throwing a few a, a few hoses on the floor, or you can get creative. You might put a swimming pool in the middle of the, in the middle of the aisle and Use that as a dump bin. You might use a wheelbarrow. The temporary displays, as we know, create that sense of urgency, and and it also gives you the chance to be creative. Uh, cross merchandising is important any time of the year, and so as you think about summer, kind of be prepared to think about those items that are going to be are going to sell well in the summer, like gloves, or maybe batteries, or or extension cords, and cross merchandise them throughout the store. But also don't forget about those other items that you may not sell that, they're, that seem to be particularly pertinent to the summer season, like bug spray or sunblock, first aid, uh, lip balms. You can put a, a few spinner racks at the service counter or at the checkout counter, and those are the kinds of items that, that seem to uh, sell well and are particularly pertinent to summer. Then finally, outdoor dis outside displays. You, Use whatever space you have outside. People like to be outside in the summer, so you can throw grills out there, lawn furniture. Um, even if the only thing you have is a strip of uh, grassy strip between the road and the parking lot, that's still a place that you can maybe park a few uh, a few lawn mowers or tillers. So I'd like to go to our panelists and kind of talk about your merchandising strategy for the summer season. How do you prepare the store, and do you have any advice for retailers who are are thinking about the merchandising strategy for the summer. Angie, could we start with you? Sure. Um, I um, believe that uh, customers, when they come in, they want to see, they want to feel, they want to touch. And to have um, products ready to go, to have staff knowledgeable in helping them, in um, building confidence. Um, to me, it's very important in today's age is to build confidence with our customers that they can come here and get the answers that they need to solve their problems, their questions, um, their ideas. Um, and so merchandising, I merchandise on the sidewalk. I also um, will utilize um, a tent and create excitement in something different by using a tent sale in the summertime um, and curiosity. It makes them wonder what's going on and, and those types of things. Um, but that's kind of how I do in gear to have things visible and ready to go. All right. Um, Tom, what about yourself in terms of merchandising? Well, again, I agree 100%. I think that the customer definitely needs to be able to feel it and touch it and, and sense it, and that all that is very important. We try to um, make sure that our look is fresh every couple of weeks so that um, it doesn't get stale and you know, people are, are not used to seeing the same item all the time. But with that said, we also keep it very seasonal so that if it's a summer presentation we're trying to do, we look summery all the time. Uh, cross merchandising is very important, as you said earlier. Um, with us, we have a pretty large houseware section, so we'll cross merchandise our, our uh, housewares goods in our patio furniture area, for example, whether it's uh, summer dishes or um, iced tea glasses or whatever it may be, to just to kind of bring that whole presentation together, and it allows you to um, get a, get a lot more add-on sales. Um, your consumables, obviously we use our power aisles and we use our end caps. Uh, we rotate those every couple of weeks as well. Um, when things are getting low, it's important to make sure that you you revisit that and you refresh them back up or you put something new out there. Uh, we use our front display area in the front of the store. We have a glass foyer that is uh, set up into basically outdoor rooms. So each room uh, kind of has its own touch and feel and sense about it. And we rotate those around periodically as well. Um, that's also where we put our green goods. and. Uh, for us, uh, bird baths and, and waterfalls and fountains are very popular, so we, we do a large display with those. And, and to have those working where the customer can actually see how they, the effect of them and, and hear the water flowing, I think that's very important. Um, so that's kind of what we do. Richard, anything What about your store? Um, nothing too different. You know, um, we've, we've got all this garden, garden product that we use, so um, getting them on end caps, making them look overflowing, uh, just seems to spark the customer's interest, um, making sure those end cap headers have big, big numbers, you know, 
the, the putting the, the larger the number, the bigger, bigger the value in the customer's mind. So make sure that you've got somebody who's got a really nice looking sign or use the headers that the, your company supply you with and make sure you've got big, big numbers on every single end cap. Um, making sure your power aisle is crowded. We opened a store three years ago and we had nice big wide power aisles and not a whole lot in them. And uh, we started crowding them up with a bunch of product and making them pretty tight and didn't notice a decrease, but we actually noticed an increase in sales just because of those, you know, it's just the best impulse area in the store. So, you know, I kind of just put it in their face, crowd, a, crowd, the, crowd the whole store with product, um, and that seems to work for us. And then simple things like balloons, you know, tied to it, the handle of a uh, of a barbecue outside. I don't know why, but it works. Yeah, sometimes those simple things is just all how it's perceived. Well, talking about uh, some of the sim- simple things, and one last thing in terms of merchandising and st- kind of store operation is housekeeping. Um, keep the store looking clean and, and fresh. You know, here we have Angie. I believe this is your store, and we correct. It's, uh, you see the clean aisles, the, the neat signage. It's important to make sure, even though the store, even though the season gets busy, to keep the aisles clear, to keep the floor mopped, and you know, merchandise dusted, fronted, and that's going to go a long way um, towards making the consumer want to shop there. And it's, it, it also might be tough during the summer. It's important to have a plan now of how you're going to deal with that during the summer if things get busy. And have a you know a retail or have an employee or two assigned specific duties of housekeeping throughout the store. Another very important part, and we touched on this earlier when we talked about master gardeners and and all his employee training. I want to ask our, our panelists, what's your approach to employee training during the summer? Are there any? Do you do anything specifically for the summer or to train your employees and to get them um, up and running for the summer? Tom, do you? What about yourself? We do. Actually, we will start our training, and we started back in February for our, our uh, summer goods in terms of lawn fertilizers and, and weed control products. We'll bring the vendor in and have them do a, a seminar with our employees, uh, usually in the morning before we open, and it'll be maybe 45 minutes to an hour, uh, depending on what what they have to talk about. We do the same with our uh barbecue manufacturers, uh, whether it's Big Green Egg or Tech or Weber, um, each of those individuals will come in. They'll have a training seminar for employees prior to the season hitting because, uh, again, I agree that it's very uh, important that your employees are knowledgeable in what they're talking about, and it, it enables them to be able to feel confidence in the sale and to have that expertise on hand, whether it's from a vendor or it's online training or whatever it might be, is, is very critical for our business. Mm-hmm. Richard, do you have any Thing, any special training that you do during the summer? Um, not especially. Our, our our employees all have one hour per week scheduled to be training somehow, some way, so whether it be the online training courses. But really the key is um, hammer your vendors because you, you, you might know everything about Scott's Lawn and Garden. You might know everything about Weber's, but um, – it's always good to refresh your staff, get them energized again, and your vendors are really, really eager to, to come in. So um, if you haven't contacted your Scott's vendor or your web, or web, or web vendor, then give them a call and, and say, hey, I'd like to do a demo day. I'd also like to do a training day. What can you do for me? And generally they say, absolutely, when do you want me, where do you want me? Um, so that's that's really important. Also, one thing that I we just ordered from one of our garden vendors now, um, taking advantage of some of the new technology like we just ordered an eye touch that is going to be loaded up with an application from I think it was L L nursery anyway it's got all of the plant virus um, insect problem um, leaf curl all those things there's going to be a, uh, an application that is uh, comprehensive that any employee can take that unit walk with a customer um, and do a search using that application that I think um, you guys might want to look into I'm not sure yeah okay. very good Angie, what about how do you approach employee training? Um, well, like um, Tom and Richard said, um, to utilize vendors and utilize um, actually one of the simplest trainings that I feel that I use that I try and teach my employees is so many times if they're caught in a situation where they don't know, I said pick up a bottle, pick up the bag, turn the can, read the back of the label. So many customers won't read the label, and even though you're reading it to the customer, they still appreciate that effort, and then you've learned yourself. 
Um, I've had employees say to me, wow, and you know so much. How did you learn it all? I read a lot of labels, guys. <laughs> and so to me, that's real basic knowledge. And um, as long as they are empowered to do it, um, they learn and the customers will appreciate it. All right. Very good. That's, that's, some, that's some good advice. Last category we want to talk about, or actually I have one more as well, but special events can be a big a big part of the story. You know, there's no better way to draw a crowd than to have a special event, and we all like to see that. And, you know, a special event doesn't have to be a big blowout blockbuster either. It can be something very simple. It can be as big as a, as a, as a tent sale, or it can be as minor as, like we talked about earlier, throwing some hot dogs on a grill and, and maybe in, inviting the local barbecue um, restaurant down the street to show off some of their secret spices and, and sauces. So, but I, I do know that several of you, and I'll start with Tom, because I know that I think this is a picture from your store, and talk about some of the events you hold. You know, one good thing, if you want to have an event, we've been talking about it, include food. Uh, could you talk about some of the events that you do, do during the summer and, and how um, you position them to uh, sell a lot, of, a lot of summer items? Sure. I mean, we, we do events... Uh basically uh, four times a year that are big events for us and in the April we do what we call our spring demo fair and that's a, a picture of what you're seeing here basically we invite about 25 to 30 manufacturers reps uh, to come to our store we hold uh, demonstrations indoors and outdoors uh, we'll set up a tent we'll have a, a place for people to sit and eat um, I usually buy um, sausages from a uh, local store that's a health food store and we do sausages and hamburgers and I'm out there grilling with them and um, it just gets people kind of something to, to have while they're there but it creates excitement and you know we'll have people drive down the road and turn around and come back in the parking lot just to see what's going on um, for us it's it's one of our biggest days of the year uh, we typically double our normal Saturday sales when we do something like this and you know the profit margin is still good you're giving a few things away but it it, it creates a uh, I guess a um, an expectation from your customers well, that now they look forward to it from the next time. So, when, hey, when are you going to have that event again? And, you know, what's, what, what are we going to have? When are those sausages going to come out? Um, it, it just it, it re-energizes the, the atmosphere, I guess, so to speak. Um, so I think that, you know, our spring demo fair is obviously one of our biggest ones. At the end of the season, in September, we hold what we call a garage sale, and that's where we kind of clear out all of our summer goods uh, that we want to get rid of, uh, whether it's patio furniture, barbecues, or um, various items that we collect through the years. And, again, we also go to our manufacturers and ask them for closeouts or, or discounts on products that maybe we can buy one or two in huge gross quantities and, and have them at a fantastic price. So it, it gives that perception that we're, we're out there really working the deals. Um, so those are probably two of the biggest events we have. We also do a ladies' night event that, that's been very successful for us over the past uh, five years. I believe we've done it, and that's when we uh, open our store up in the evening. Uh, we dim the lights. We have... Uh, uh, beverages and we have food that we have a local restaurant cater um, it's been a very classy event we use dishes and, and you know champagne glasses and wine glasses and usually uh, the food is presented very well and we offer a discount for the ladies to come in that night and it's really a two-hour event that I'll do a whole day sales in two hours so I, again this is another thing that they, they expect it and they look forward to it and doing stuff like that really sets you apart from your typical Home Depot or Lowe's where they're not going to be able to do that sort of thing so events like that are, are huge for us okay another another thing about the summer is people want to be outside so set up your event and just like Tom has done set your, up your event outside Andy this picture from your store uh, can you tell us about some of the events that you do during the summer um, well I um, start uh, the summer um, or I guess spring and summer with my garden market um, I also have um, done the grill um, grill demos. Um, I've had a 4-H club um, give away Rip Your Floats for Dairy Month in June, and they were amazed at how many people wanted to pay for their free Rip Your Floats, and, um, and they were excited about it. And um, again, having something outside that people could see when they drove by caused excitement. Um, this is my tent sale um, where I loaded stuff into the tent, had it outside. It created excitement. 
um, and giving them something to do. Um, I haven't done a ladies' night uh, because me being a woman and entertaining women for women, and I'm not a wine person, so that hasn't worked for me. But I've done um, something called Friends and Family. Um, because that's more of my focus and um, giving discounts. My employees empowered to give discounts to their friends and family for a two-hour in the evening type of a deal, and that's been um, worked very well for me and for my employees um, taking ownership of the um, idea and them benefiting to their friends and family. So um, those are kind of the promotions I've done. Okay. Very good. And Richard, do you have special events there at, at any of your stores? Uh, nothing super special. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed. Uh, well, that's uh, all right. Not really. The one thing I, I would say that um, if you haven't considered this already, you should because we've got uh, – I'm surrounded by Orchard, Orchard Supply Hardwares, and um, I don't know who thought up the no sales tax event that they run – but they seem to run it almost every weekend. A couple of years ago, it was once a quarter, maybe, uh, and then they started picking it up to you know once a month. And they just keep seeming to throw those out there. And I don't know why, but the, our events that we run that are no sales tax days uh, do almost better than our 20% off bag sale bag sale days. What is so, your sales tax? Can I ask? Uh, mine is 9.25. Wow. Yeah, we're yeah. but it, but you know they they run a no sales tax event and um, our district manager is an old orchard manager and he he's just blown away by the numbers he says I can't believe how much they generate it's just for some reason that that key term sales tax you know we pay the sales tax for some reason and the consumers minds just drives them crazy so I've had great success with that um, so if you haven't considered that event um, it's a very simple one to set up very simple to execute and I would highly suggest it. Okay, very good. Thank you. A couple other ideas that we have from a couple other retailers around the country. I mentioned earlier that the summer it gets really hot. Some people just don't want to come out and do anything. Another thing that creates the summer blues for retailers is that people go on vacation and kids are going back to school. So parents are thinking more about getting their you know, kids backpacks and clothes and school supplies than they are about buying hardware. So we have a retailer out in, down in Spring, Texas, uh, Greg Farrell at Lone Star Hardware. He invited the local PTA to come to the store, set up some tables, and and distribute information about the coming school year. And he he, he did had a few giveaways. He gave away some string backpacks and some things with his store information on them. But he found that that was a kind of a way to use that a time in the summer when it it, it might be a little uh, dead because people you know, are are busy doing other things to draw some attention to a store. And it also generates some goodwill because you're bringing the PTA in there. And then down in Germantown, Tennessee, uh, we have a retailer in Germantown Hardware. John Wagner sold space to local vendors, homeowners or, or gardeners that wanted to bring in their, their fruits and vegetables or homemade items. And he has filled up the parking lot every Saturday with, with booths. And it's, it's a community event. People come just for the farmer's market, but at the same time, now they know where the hardware store is. And they might go in and buy something or they might... Um, come back the next time when they need something. So it helps get a lot of exposure for his store. And just a, another way that he's found, uh, that, that a retailer's found to, to uh, have an outside event. Getting um, almost out of time here, but I want to run through a few trends that we've seen here, and we might ask if there's any others. Canning, it continues to be a, 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 big, a big thing for retailers. Like, like whenever I talk to someone who is selling canning supplies their sales this year are two or three times what they sold the previous year so this continues to be popular as well as home gardening and home gardening isn't just uh, people in the country i think urban areas are finding they can they that people in urban areas that want to garden as well raised bed gardening as well as square foot gardening that makes it easier for the elderly to to garden as because the uh the, the soil is up off the ground, you don't have to bend over. So that's a trend. And of course, variety is always, always sells. If you, nobody wants the same thing their neighbor has. So if you have a, a different bird bath or a different yard, yard or, ornament, um, just having a variety of items that people can buy, something that looks unique and something that can, that, uh, like I said, they don't have the same thing as 
especially next to him. So Jesse, I, Jesse, one thing to consider with the canning is we always seem to get kicked in the pants all at once, so you need to be very aware of when the canning season starts and when it ends because um, some of your employees will see uh, canning selling like crazy, so they order a whole pile of it just in time for canning season to end, and now you're stuck on product. So make sure that you're very aware um, of when that window is. Okay, that's a good point. Any uh, Anything, closing comments from anyone else about trends or summer selling in general? Uh, I will. Um, um, I have, a, I guess, a comment that the raised gardening is just starting to get to our neck of the woods, and in fact, um, that is a focus um, that I'm going to have um, for the summer selling season. Is starting off with my garden market, but I'm going to also have them um, build a garden in a raised garden and have it in our in our parking lot all summer long, and um, hopefully draw some interest and some curiosity for my customers to just come back and see how our garden's doing through the whole summer season. So I'm excited about that. Very good, like little case projects. So watch yep. it grow and then try it yourself. Yep. Okay. Uh, Tom, any closing comments? Uh, no, I agree with everything you guys said. I mean, definitely the canning, uh, I agree with that. You have to make sure you're in it right and you're out of it right. Um, square foot gardening for us has been uh, big over the past couple of years. We're, we're going to continue to focus on that. Um, we're seeing a huge impact uh, in our customer base for that need, and uh, it's uh, something that we'll, we probably won't uh, do a full garden, but we'll definitely do a good display of it this year and try to take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, variety, again, like I said, for us, water fountains, bird baths, um, you're right there. You have to have some unique stuff. You have to make sure that you have an offering that will fit um, kind of everybody's need and uh, you know again working displays are powerful if they can see it and they can sense the water and things like that I think that makes a big impact okay there was one product I wanted to throw out there that you um, you guys might want to try I, I'm sensing that there's some interest in the uh, raised bed um, units Certainly. there's a company that uh, demonstrated at the sunset mess uh, sunset magazine festival this last summer it was our first year in business and they've uh, they've been taking off we brought in a bunch of their products so i'm going to throw up a link here on that um say to everyone participants it's just a it's a brace that has um it's a decorative brace that you can sell to a customer and all they need to do is buy the lumber for it and it's a drop in no fasteners required um sets up in you know 20 minutes uh, it's an interesting product, and I've been doing fairly well with it. I would uh, recommend staying away from the accessories that they have, the little art that supplements the um, the brace, uh, but the brace itself is actually a pretty good product. Okay. Well, very good. Thanks Thanks for that. If everyone can see that, that's artofthegarden.net. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending this afternoon, and thank you for our panelists, Angie, Richard, and Tom, for helping us out today. And we look forward to seeing you or – hearing from you. If you have any ideas or have any additional comments, feel free to email me. It's jcarlton at nrha.org um, or any other creative ideas that you have. Um, we're always looking for um, things that unique things that retailers across the country are doing so that we can share the news in hardware retailing. So once again, thank you, and I hope everyone has a good day. Thanks, Jesse. Thank All right, you. Thank you.